777 Radio Podcast, and uh, this will serve as episode six. Uh, episode seven, this is a great episode with James Alfred, by the way, and I will tell you what's in the second hour here in a second, but I want to talk about episode seven. Um, Dave J., who so many people are familiar with, and um, so many have the idea that he is controversial, very difficult to get along with. Um, I do a two-hour show with him for episode seven, and it is damn interesting. Um, I'm actually going to title that show as Dave J., the man who saw through the veil and raged and then found peace. I was just kind of stunned when I caught back up with him to see what's become of him since he's left public life of YouTube and gone off grid. Um, anyhow, that will be episode seven. Episode six here with James Alfred is a great, great show. For those of you who uh, have followed me, you know that James Alfred first came onto the scene by taking the Hattie Bob material and a number of things that I had been saying on my channel and basically digging in to challenge it and to see what he could find for himself. Um, so let me quickly outline. This is the first free hour. The second hour will be running for members on crow777radio.com. And here's what we cover in the second hour. We cover portal, portals, movie encoding, space as water, the prison planet, Babylon, the moon child, Parsons and magicians at NASA, L. Ron Hubbard connection, the Crowley connection, Richard Hoagland, black magic and Satanism at NASA, CERN, comic books, a Jewish relationship to comic book creation, firmament, the dome or the boundary of space, the media system, music, the Beatles, the hoaxed Paul McCartney, uh, famous rockers like Jimmy Page, encoded music, the death of Paul McCartney, the hoax Paul McCartney that we see now, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction of Ringo Starr by the new hoax Paul McCartney, the 27 Club, the weaponization of music, Beatle mania, Elvis mania, mania for people who don't remember that, and then all the way back to the 1700s with Paganini, the first kind of mania music guy. We talk about the 4.3 hertz tuning versus the new 4.40 tuning, which is weaponized music. I talk about how to tune or retune your iPod music to 4.3.2. We talk about demons in music, knighted musicians working for the crown, royalty in music. We talk about and finally answer if Hattie Bob is a real person or Hattie Bow. We talk about the JFK assassination hoax, the hoax, the faked Zapruder film, and the future work of Sage Sigma Unbound blog, which James Alfred runs. And lastly, the world population. Is it possible that it never really changes? But that is all the stuff that we cover in the second hour, and it's a hell of a second hour. So I hope you'll join me at Crow 777 Radio. And without anything further, here we are, the first free hour with James Alfred. Cheers. All right, welcome to Crow 777 Radio Podcast. This is Episode 6 with James Alfred. Uh, many of my longtime followers will remember James as he started the Sage Sigma Unbound blog. And at the time, uh, he took over the Hattie Bob. And actually, was while I was still talking about Hattie Bob, James had begun to really systematize the Hattie Bob material. Um, but that's just an indicator to get people clued in to who we're talking with today. So without any further ado, uh, welcome, James. Uh, how are you? Doing good. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited. Looking forward to this. Hey, I'm glad to have you on, man. I, you, you're one of the very few people who came to my channel, watched what I was doing, and then went out and challenged it, looked at it carefully um, to see what you could do independently of me. And uh, it was a great thing because I needed to step away from Hattie Bob. It just wasn't really meshing with what I was doing other than it probably mentions the lunar wave. Mm -hmm. But I completely appreciated the fact that you took it. But why don't you give people a little background on yourself and uh, include how you got involved with me? Sure, sure. Um, my background really is uh, kind of the curiosity towards all of this uh, alternative information and uh, conspiracy, whatever you want to call it. it began when I was younger, uh, middle school, high school, kind of followed a couple of books. Uh, you know, JFK, I think my father was into the JFK conspiracy theory. So that ultimately probably was the first time I had any exposure to an idea that, you know, there was a false news story or a false uh, story pretended on to the public and, and people more or less bought into it. Uh, went to school, uh, went to college, uh, initially 
I was trying for a two-in-one degree situation, was attempting to get a physics and engineering degree, did three years of that, and then it dawned on me that I um, enjoyed the physics more than the engineering side of things, but couldn't get a job with a physics degree unless I went on to get a doctorate or a master. So uh, fate had it that I hopped over into sociology and accounting, uh, finished up there, and uh, since school have, has um, more or less been a cost accountant. Uh, for the past 15 years, uh, working for various manufacturing companies, uh, food, beverage, um, garments, you name it. I've I've probably put some costs together on some things that uh, people out there have bought. So uh, that's more or less kind of my background. Uh, in terms of like the analytics, uh, as we were talking earlier, uh, the cost accounting field is, is somewhat similar to breaking down any piece of uh, body of work. Uh, in my case, it's more or less looking at the nuts and bolts of whether it be electricity, uh, labor, sewage, I mean, you name it, there's a cost to it, and it rolls up into uh, an end outcome. So uh, one of the reasons I really got attracted to the Hattie Bowes stuff is I, I think I'd mentioned this on the THC interview with you. Uh, first, the lunar wave was absolutely mind-boggling at the time, uh, the stuff that you had captured. And then when the Hattie Bowe material got put into it, I immediately dug into the links that you had posted online. And to me, it's you know it's similar to any other body of work. You, you really want to just break it down, make sense of it, kind of put it to the nuts and bolts, and then rebuild it back up into something that makes sense. So similar to kind of what I do day to day um, in a completely different field of, uh, of research and, and work. Well, with the Hattie Bob stuff, it was a bit mind-numbing for me just to see you translate uh, from Russian of all things, and I don't know what it is about Russian, but you can take almost any other language that you're faced with online and get better translations than you get for Russian. Um, although I understand you, you started to get a knack for it at the end, but uh, the way you systematize that kind of very dense, um, I assume, research material that we were looking at, uh, it was incredible because it was hard to follow. It was in the wrong language. The translations weren't great, mm -hmm. and it was all over the place. So by the time you had it all laid out on your blog, Sage Sigma, um, you, the average person could really get a sense of things. But, I mean, since we're talking about it, I know for a fact that there's a ton of followers who really didn't want me to step away from Hattie Bob, but mm -hmm. um, it got to the point where you know people were acting like they were going to open up the Church of the Spider or something. So... Yeah. Um, I just didn't want to go there anymore, but why don't you catch us up a little bit on the Hattie Bob stuff, um, and if you can, correlate the lunar wave in. Sure, sure. Um, the most recent piece, which actually turned out to be fairly popular, I've got quite a few hits on that. Um, I did set up a new website at the beginning of the year just so that I could kind of start fresh and do some more things with photographs and videos down the, uh, the road, but um, I guess... The solar system, to me, uh, in terms of the Hattie Bow material, is the most recent posting that I've put out there. Uh, and it's again, it's very, very dense. I had to piece together again. You know, you've seen it before. There's like 300 pages of documentation that are kind of fragmented and piecemealed together, and then compiled all of that to kind of put together a, a model, a Hattie Bow model of the solar system, and. Uh, that really is the most interesting thing, I think, so far. I mean, you can put aside the spider idea. I, again, I think, you know, we've talked in the past, I think the spider is a, a metaphor for something else. I don't necessarily think there was a eight-legged species of aliens that came to Earth. I think it, it's disguising something else. It's a symbol for something else. And uh, when you start to look at the solar system in context of the Hattie Boy, I mean, it immediately makes sense. You you get the sense that uh, the solar system is a closed System. I mean, it's um, you know it's similar to like a prison system. You can't escape it. You can't uh, enter it. If, uh, as I've mentioned before, there's the idea that if if there were another extraterrestrial race out there and they wanted to help Earth, it's it's not possible. Uh, but the the thing that really stands out is the idea of the cube that uh, more or less is dictating reality in our solar system. And I know there's quite a bit of other research on that. You can look at Saturn or the Moon. Um, but in the context of Hattie Bow, it really comes down to that 8-bit uh, music tone, that 8-bit information system or that series, which is the Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, uh, T, Na, I think it is. And yeah. um, it's a cube. I mean, it's basically what he's saying is that there are eight base bits of data that 
only make sense in the context of our solar system. They don't make sense outside of our solar system. Or, again, the solar system could be a metaphor for something maybe a little bit more close, like a, a closed Earth or whatever you would want to call it. But um, it's just that to me is it's opened up my eyes again. I, the thing that I find interesting about Hattie Bow is <clears throat> I think I've got 10 articles posted up, and each time I peel back a little bit more of the onion, of the layer of the onion, and it, it just it's growing. It's like you're getting more and more past the idea of a spider into something a little bit much more uh, abstract, but that could potentially be what he's ultimately trying to describe, like the, the reality of of matter that surrounds us, the reality that surrounds all of us. So I'm going to have to catch up on that, but I mean, clearly just the black cube is a thing. I mean, mm -hmm. there's statues of it or whatever you would call them, monuments that people have built all over the place. There's the work of Stanley Kubrick. Sure, sure. Um, in 2001, who basically puts the cube-like thing up on the moon and on earth and all over the solar system mm -hmm. um do you get a sense that the cube is in the hattie bob research is intended to be an actual physical thing is it a reference to saturn in any way i mean what's your sense of it uh it's interesting with saturn because he makes note that saturn at one point in time again uh to catch people up it's the idea there was a solar system that existed uh prior to the mid 18,000s bc and at some point in time, a group of planets and satellites entered our solar system, that being the sun, the moon, and other planets or uh, other satellites that go around planets in our solar system. Uh, but again, it's, it's not necessarily a cube per se. Um, Saturn apparently was the, it, it, it's hinted that at one point in time, Saturn dictated time in our solar system. It dictated perhaps a different program. Um, yeah. Uh, and then at some point in time, the sun more or less took that over. This, the idea in the material is that the sun emits this 128 octave, which is the equivalent of one second. And on multiple times in the original Hattie Bow literature, it makes note that one second isn't um, the original time for our species. It's it's foreign. It's the time that we're currently living the pace at, that, that one second, it's, it's not original. It's not native to the human species. And... Uh, as far as the cube, the cube, again, isn't necessarily a structure that's floating around in outer space or hidden below a, a planet. It could be. Um, the material doesn't explicitly state that. But it's the idea that there are the eight uh, corners, uh, the eight-bit information, the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, na. That's ultimately what the cube is. And it's this interplay of these different octaves, these base eight octaves that generates reality that's unique to our solar system. And again, anything outside of our solar system, it may have a different series of octaves that dictates reality. But um, it, it's really fascinating. I mean, and then you start to get into like the Pythagorean idea and the Gnostic stuff, um, and it all kind of ties together into one big picture that makes uh, some sense. Well, of the Hattie Bob research, the two things that really pulled me in was the possibility that I had found someone who was actually referring to the lunar wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is at a time when no one had filmed it or very few people had filmed it. Um, I don't remember exactly when it was. I guess it was in 2015. So a couple people had filmed it at least. Um, and the octaves idea. Uh, the octaves, even now, you know, yesterday I announced that I believe space is probably liquid or water. Mm -hmm. and even to where I have come now, the idea of the sun, the moon, octaves, and a system built with this kind of construct uh, I think it it really is an important thing to consider um, of course we both know Hattie Bob says so much else and it's just yeah. really hard to know um, you know if we were to accept that the flat earth movement is absolutely right and that um, that's the way things are we would notice that it's not written anywhere mm -hmm. which would mean that any reference to that was so well hidden the information was scrubbed and that's just an example but mm -hmm. I kinda got the sense in the Hattie Bob material that we were looking at edited or scrubbed or as you were alluding to earlier encoded information um, do you get that sense? Yo, know, definitely I mean even the idea of the 8-bit uh, octave I mean that's eight legs and a spider I mean could that very well be what he's using to reference this cubic octave structure that dictates 
uh, everything around us. Um, on top of that, I mean, as we've talked in the past, there are blatant interjections of different statements or sentences. I mean, you when you look at it long enough, there's a flow. There's definitely like a, a sensibility to the writing style, and you can tell at specific points that there's a copy and paste job or somebody's gone in after the fact. That's that's definitely true. I'm um, in complete agreement with you on that. Right, right. And uh, so we don't beat too much Hattie Bob here because you have so much of it broken mm -hmm. down so well and posted on the Sage Sigma blog spot. Yeah, thank you. Can you just, um, and people should go there. Um, I walked away from it uh, because mainly I was watching followers latch onto the idea of an alien spider race and literally acting like they were about to start the Church of Spider. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to people, we don't even know for sure this man was real. And the main interest for me had started with the lunar wave. So with that in mind, um, can you just, before we move on to maybe the moon, and we'll start with the lunar wave, can you address the possibility that Hattie Bob was in fact addressing the lunar wave? He was. There's a, a very unique piece called Luna. Um and that is also one of the more popular ones on the website. I'd recommend anybody check it out if they haven't checked it out already. Uh, but again, some of the key pieces to the moon um, and ultimately to the lunar wave, it's the moon is foreign. It's, artily, it's an artificially created structure that provides life support to both the moon and to the earth. Um, it creates its own life. I'm sorry. It creates its own light through the use of pyramids and facilities on the lunar moon. And it's more or less luminous. So again, it's, He's stating, like so many others, that the the light that bounces off of the um, moon isn't necessarily that of the sun reflecting off of the moon. The, the moon is generating its own light. Um, and then there's different times that uh, peaks that the full moon, partial moon, new moon, and so forth, that they're more or less generating a program that runs the planet. So with that in mind, you just if you can kind of think of it, the moon is just basically a, a part of a larger system of control that dictates uh, matter, reality on this planet. Uh, so in regards specifically to the lunar wave, I have found five pieces in that, um, that article that I think potentially could be somewhat of an explanation for what we could be seeing. Again, this is all speculation. You know, we, this could all be fiction as far as who's writing this and so forth. So I want to make sure that people understand that. Uh, the first one would be it's a um, magnetic pulse that is intended to reset or adjust a program on Earth. There's also the idea that it's uh, there's radiation power. There's four phases of radiation power that are emitted from the moon. And those things basically uh, impact human behavior, such as reproduction, uh, behavior, fertility. It also looks at crop production, etc. And these four phases of radiation power are static for unique periods of time, and then they transition into a different radiation phase. So the speculation there is that the lunar wave is this rotation or this uh, shift from phase A to phase B, where there's a different radiation power that's being emitted and uh, sent due to Earth. Uh, another idea is the orbit correction. Again, the, the basic idea is that the moon is foreign to the solar system. It was never initially... Uh, circulating the earth and so at certain points of time there's a change to that uh to that correction i'm sorry to that orbit so when the moon corrects itself it needs to more or less uh kind of uh, i don't know how to say this but it would it, it adjusts itself in context to the earth and there's an idea that the moon is connected to the earth through these gravitational tubes these oct there's like an octave series that connects the earth to the moon, and when that happens, there's sort of a disruption or a uh, sort of uh, a wave that is emitted when this when the moon is self-correcting. So, a third possible idea to the lunar wave would be that the moon, when it is filmed, it's correcting. It's more or less putting itself back in place because it naturally wants to be separate from the Earth. Uh, the fourth one is that there's an idea that the surface of the moon is a uh, facade. I think a lot of people out there are probably familiar with some of the work that's been done on that. And um, the idea there that there's complexes, pyramids, and so forth that are below the surface of the Earth and that there's this false surface that's projected. Uh, at one point in time, it mentions the idea of uh, the surface of the moon is being created by sputtering followed by heating. So... If you look into that online, there's some research done as far as the idea that there's kind of a film of particles that are laid out on a surface. So you, you eject it from like a base material, and these particles are laid out onto a, another surface, heated, and then that more or less 
creates kind of a fictitious surface in manufacturing. It's creating like a, I believe it's like a surface to like a microchip or something of that sort. And then the, the final one is asteroid deference. Uh, the heady bow material on numerous occasion makes point that the uh, moon is the only one that's actually in communication with the base constellation in Magrez, the Magrez system, which is actually the, the tail in Ursa Major, uh, the constellation. And because it's the only one that has any contact with uh, the overriding program that's emitted from Migrez, uh, it's the most important part of the super system. And so there's this meteoroid shield that uh, surrounds it and prevents meteoroids from breaking the surface of the Earth. Uh, there's an interesting quote that says that if at any point in time the surface of the moon were broken, the development of civilized humanity would cease and be discontinued. So... He more or less, or he, she, whoever Hattie Bo is, is stating that the moon is the most critical piece to um, our existence. Man, there, there is just so much that it's funny, you know, now that I'm hearing all this again. Uh, I just posted a clip on the 2012 footage that shows that as each wave goes by, it displaces the moon a little. Um, and I had actually said I had not caught up on the Hattie Bob stuff that you have posted um, is it possible that we're looking at a correction so that the the moon appears to be in the right place? Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, of all the things you just said, there are so many things that could draw me in. Um, but I, I'm trying to just kind of stay independent, do my research. But in mm -hmm. all the Hattie Bob material, um, I think I know the answer to this. Is there any references in that writing uh, that you think could be alluding to space as liquid? <laughs> Yes, it's, uh, that's ultimately the idea of the highly organized plasma, that everything around all of us is just plasma, and, you know, whether that's water or a water-type substance, you know, that could be up to debate. But um, the idea is that you have highly organized plasma that's infinite, possibly, potentially, uh, in the universe, and then there's a discharge of information in the form of octaves that manipulates this plasma into various states of matter. And going back to uh, the human brain, for instance, and, and biostructures on this planet, the information is being emitted from a source object into highly organized plasma, and then it's being modified to look like water, gas, um, another thing would be like rocks or whatever, but it's completely dependent on the perspective of the observer. So it's kind of this strange circular idea. You have the infinite... It's limited, and it makes sense to um, you, I, whoever else might be out there looking at, uh, I don't know, the night sky or a tree. And that's just information. It's just data that we're processing as being a tree. So uh, definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, and going back to like the Pythagorean stuff, you, you get the sense that it's kind of uh, the infinite being limited and then there being a, a pleasant tone or a pleasant transmission of data in this finite portion of the infinite that makes sense and creates reality, I guess, for lack of a better word. You know, early on, uh, before I'd even really made the Hattie Bob stuff public on YouTube, um, one of the first of the number of papers that I got my hands on that disappeared later, a lot of the links that they I, did. Had, yeah, I had access to by the time you were involved um, I was sending links, and I came to understand that someone had been removing Hattie Bob material. But having said this, there was a uh, one of the earliest pet papers, and I don't remember if it was the Luna or the one right after the Luna, where Hattie Bob states uh, the exact date where this planet was no longer free. And it resonated with me because I'd already read the octaves, and I thought there was something very probable in using octaves to describe and at the time I had used the word hologram for the mm -hmm. lunar wave and lived to regret that but uh, I had already established in my mind that nobody was leaving low earth orbit couldn't mm -hmm. there just couldn't be done and that in some sense that makes this a prison planet and the people who are ruling down here are no different than we are they can't leave uh, they may be trying uh, and that was one of the many things that really resonated with the Hattie Bob material. But then as you break, you know, out what you were just talking about, how the lunar wave is possibly referenced so many times. But anyhow, let's let's leave Hattie Bob alone and mm -hmm. people head over to Sage Sigma Blogspot um, 
and you can catch up because no matter what we say, it is not broken down as well as he has it posted on the blog. But let's stick with the moon for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the cool things about James was, as I had stated for a long time, that the worldwide meme of the moon was always associated with sleep, death, and insanity. And James decided to put that to the test. Um, and the last time I think you and I had any real back and forth about it was when Lady Gaga covered what I consider Bowie's fraudulent death and, you know, the whole spider from Mars on her face and all that. But um, let's jump into what you have found paying attention to the moon and testing out my claim that the moon is constantly associated with sleep, death, and insanity. Sure, sure. Uh, You know, actually, one of the first experiments I did with this uh, began watching the Super Bowl, this most recent Super Bowl. And, of course, the idea in a lot of conspiracy theorist circles, um, the idea is that there's a lot of programming that's embedded in the commercials. You've got X amount of people watching a single television um, a single image that's displayed on a television. So there's an idea that there's a lot of uh, psychological power that's focused in on one spot. And there's also the potential for a lot of manipulation uh, by what's being shown on the screen. So I began there. Uh, the first one, of course, was kind of a simple one. It was like a McDonald's all-day breakfast one. Uh, of course, the full moon shows up, and there's people kind of sleeping, I believe, at that point in time. Not, not a whole lot of seriousness to it. I think there was also maybe a, a sleep another commercial that had a sleep medicine or, or something of the sort with a full moon depicted. But the one that was really interesting to me was the Audi commercial. Um, and that, if people can remember, it was a big hit on YouTube. Um, you have an in, a, a former NASA astronaut who's at home, who's bored. He looks despondent into life. He's kind of checked out. Um, and he's looking at photographs of his previous days of glory and so forth. Um, and his son shows up, and his son's got a brand-new vehicle. And he asks his dad if he wants to go for a lift. So this former NASA commander uh, gets in the car. Um, Of course, David Bowie's song comes on. So you're picking up on all the, you know, the sentiment at the time. Everybody said that we had just lost David Bowie. Um, And then he proceeds to get in the car and he's constantly flashing back to being in a Saturn V rocket, I think. And so he's getting this sense of exhilaration as he's driving down this road while this um, flashback into his days with uh, him being in a rocket blasting off into space. And, uh, of course, uh, David Bowie's being playing over it, so everybody's completely focused in on this commercial. And then at one point in time, he's driving around a bend, and there's a large moon, full moon, that hangs over the uh, surface of the road or just over the horizon. So that I thought was very interesting, and you know, kind of getting into the idea even of not being able to escape Earth. I don't believe in that commercial. They actually show the astronaut making uh getting past orbit i mean ultimately they're just showing them in a in a rocket that's shooting off the surface of the earth but at never at any point in time are they referring to him making it to the moon or being placed in a like a upper orbit that circles the earth i thought in retrospect that's kind of interesting that they didn't take it as far as they implied it and they definitely got people to kind of side with the astronaut because you're playing david bowie and so forth but they never actually showed him breaking orbit uh in the rocket. So it's kind of something in retrospect that I thought was very interesting. Well, it's, it's clear they're just keying everybody off. I mean, if you look at the, from the name of Bowie's band, you know, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars to the song Starman, um, there's a litany of ground control, the major Tom space oddity. Um, there's a whole litany of songs and Bowie's public fascination with UFOs that mm-hmm. really ties Bowie to be kind of like the space rocker. Um, and they're playing on all that. But in the depiction there, did you get a sense that death, insanity, or sleep were being uh, memed across? I think so. You know, you have an individual who's probably past his prime, and he's completely checked out. You know, the, the saving grace there is to go buy a fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 car, which <laughs> isn't feasible for most people. But, um, you know, the, the initial part of that was just a... It was definitely a play that as you get older, people fade out and, you know, whether it's a car that is going to correct that, I, I don't think that's the case, but it was definitely implied in that commercial. Uh, you know, even on further research, I think there was a Audi sponsored project where they're trying to send another rover right. to the moon, which I thought was interesting too. Was, and the name of the organization was something like uh, the part-time project or the 
the part-time scientist or something like that. <laughs> you know, it just implies something very weird there where you're trying to send a rover to the moon, but it's just a part-time situation. <laughs> it's, it's interesting how that all fit together. It's so downplayed now, you know, back when, you know, in the 60s when it was the right stuff and they all had to be Iron Man to even be considered. And now on Big Bang, you know, a small Jewish guy with asthma who never did anything physical, he can go to the space station anytime he wants. But, I mean, let's pull this forward because you mm -hmm. and I had talked about uh, the whole Lady Gaga yeah. ridiculousness around Bowie's death. And there was actually seemingly a lunar wave worked into – uh, the Gaga performance. Can you address that? Definitely. I think, uh, let me make sure I get the right thing. It was the 58th annual Grammys, which um, appeared, I think, two weeks after the Super Bowl on CBS. Uh, the clip is was really interesting. I actually was made aware of it. A, an anonymous user posted a comment asking me my thoughts on the, on the presentation uh, on my old blog site. So I looked it up the next day and kind of dug through it. Um, it's just a very, very strange uh ad i mean it's got lady gaga who's got her eyes closed uh if i remember correctly she starts singing uh space oddity i think that's bowie's big first number one hit or it was around the time of 1969 that he yeah. kind of got big uh so she's has her eyes closed she's singing there's kind of a lightning face paint that comes across her face um then suddenly there's a spider that materializes out of her right eye and it begins to kind of crawl over her face uh, she's singing still. Her eyes are still closed, and the spider continues to crawl on her face. Um, and then at some point in time, it gets to the middle of her forehead, starts to spin, and is absorbed into the brain, which is interesting because, of course, in the Hattie Bow material, <laughs> there's that constant um, implication that our brains are merged within an arachnid brain, and that's the basis of humanity uh, since early uh, B.C. or something of that sort. Uh, but that in that point in time, there's a couple of images that appear to show up on her head. You've got the lunar moon, and you suddenly have waves that are crossing through it, which for anybody listening to this podcast, I mean, it looks like a lunar wave. I, I don't know what else to make of that. Um, I think it goes from a moon, it transforms back to Earth, and then it transforms back to the moon. And then Lady Gaga begins to kind of decay uh, or some people at work thought she was turning into an extraterrestrial at that point in time, and then it fades out, and then the live performance begins. But it's only uh, a minute six or something of the sort. Uh, it's it's quite a clip, a lot of stuff embedded in that minute. Yeah, you know, when you, you're the one who brought it to my attention because I normally don't follow stuff like that, so I don't remember if you sent me a link or I went and found it. But I looked at an HD version of it, um, and I was stunned because it does look like the lunar wave. And for my money, it looks like when she starts to decompose that there's a bit of alien going on there and a bit of like a skull or death yeah. um, associating death with the moon again. Mm -hmm. um, and I will maintain, you know, till the end of my days uh, that death is so strongly associated with the moon. And that was one of the lures of, in Hattie Bob as well, you know, like you were mentioning um, the genotypes, the brain types, um, the actual regulation of every facet of our lives from a control system. Um, and even in that writing, you could correlate the death of human beings back to the control center of the moon in some of it. Mm -hmm. But um, you didn't stop um, just randomly looking at a couple things. I mean, you went into The Bachelor. Um, yeah. Keep, keep going down the road with, with what you found challenging my assertion that the moon represents sleep, death, and insanity. Sure, sure. Well, a little backstory just for everybody. I'm not uh, a Bachelor fan, fan per se. Uh, my wife and I started watching it together as something to do. So um, as much as I'd like to believe that love can be found on TV over the course of, you know, 20-some episodes, <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe that. Um, it was in this most recent season that I think it was like three or four episodes in, I just suddenly became aware that the moon was consistently shown. Uh, and, of course, you have an idea that The Bachelor is owned by Disney Corp, one of the premier powerhouses of all of media. Uh, and it's on ABC, which, of course, is owned by Disney Co. and so forth. But I think around episode five, I started to just write down notes. Anytime the, the moon was shown, a full moon typically, um, I just made references to what was being shown before, after, or during that scene. And... Uh, I was able to get a couple of words down that I thought were really interesting. Um, there were a couple of occasions where there was some snoring, which, of course, implies sleep. Uh, there was a, another one where 
this one of the girls was chatting and she made a comment that this is so false it blows my mind uh <laughs> that was played immediately thereafter uh another one that happened was um you have to do a little something more extreme tonight i'm going to have to do something a little bit more extreme and she's kind of got a crazed look on her face like she's going to take it to the next level to you know to win love or so forth um and then there was also some comments with nervousness awesome uh false again a couple times uh you know it was a uh, it was pretty interesting to see that there were some correlations it didn't always work out and um unfortunately i missed the first four episodes i tried to go back but to be honest they're so painful to watch um you know the first time through i really couldn't didn't have the patience to sit there and watch re- uh, a couple of them again. So what I'd like to do this next time, I think there's another uh, season coming out that I'm sure we'll have to watch here. And I'm going to definitely catalog every single incident in a little bit more scientific analytical method. So just to be clear, what we're talking about here is whenever you're faced with an image of the moon in media, movies, TV, whatever it is, commercial, <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, James was going to test if, in fact, he could see a correlation between sleep and sanity and death. Um, and while he did begin to find it, um, I would just say to the listening audience, um, you don't need anyone to do this for you. Whenever you're mm-hmm. watching something and you see the moon depicted, pay attention to what was said right before the moon was depicted, during and after. And you will find that I think predominantly uh, death is is the association, but there is close seconds and thirds with insanity and the idea of being asleep. But if we wanted to keep taking this down the road, um, there was, you, you, we had talked at some point or you had emailed me about the, uh, remember that clip came out that was supposedly Stanley Kubrick saying, yeah, I faked it all. Yeah. Um, You had, you had examined that, hadn't you? I had, you know, it's, uh, I think it kind of hit the circuit back in November of December of last year, and people were very excited about this Stanley Kubrick uh, a, a mission of truth, or I should say, his uh, him coming forward and confessing that he didn't did indeed uh, fake the lunar landings in 1969. And then I think at some point in time there was some additional research or not research um, footage that was released after that, and it shows that it's clearly a hoax. I mean, the director is yelling at this guy to like you know, act this way when you're stating this statement and so forth. It's fairly uh, obvious that it, it's not genuine um, information. It's not Stanley Kubrick. It's not Stanley Kubrick admitting to hoaxing the Apollo 1969 lunar mission. Um, so I, I kind of got the sense, you know, of late, um, my, I get a feeling that there's a lot of interest in the idea that the lunar hoax was was faked, it, or I'm sorry, the lunar landing was faked. And there seems to be a, a mass media rebuttal to that. There's going to this idea of the Stanley Kubrick admitting to it, and then you know, oh, by the way, it was just a hoax. It's not real. Um, you know, going back to the Audi commercial from the Super Bowl. You know, you're playing David Bowie. Everybody's crying. Probably that was a big fan. Again, they're never actually showing that individual getting to the moon, but they're definitely implying it that it was something that happened. Um, and then recently, I think there was, uh, I don't know if it's out yet, but there's a new Discovery TV TV show called, I think, NASA's Unexpected Files. Yeah. Um, and I think that's supposed to be airing soon or it's um, more or less been out. But I looked into it. Um, this NASA's Unexpected Files, the uh, the clip that kind of made its way in mainstream media was these uh, noises. It was like space music that was allegedly heard on the far side of the moon during I want to say Apollo 10 missions or something of the sort and uh, looked into the producer. Uh, the producer is an interesting guy. He seems to be a technology futurist, uh, background in game design, programming research. Uh, he worked in the Naval Postgraduate School with research focused on networked virtual reality and simulations. Uh, these audio clips that were released to the public were very limited. You know, they were supposedly like an hour of this space music that was recorded, but um I don't think that's been released. And then uh, I looked into the, at the time, I just was curious what was out for music. And it turns out in that same month that this Apollo 10 or 9 mission was supposed to be happening, uh, George Harrison released his electronic sound album in May of 1969. Uh-huh. Um, so again, I'm, I'm probably, you know, 
cherry picking some random facts from that time period to, to imply that there's something going on. But I find it curious that the idea that there's this campaign to smear the the Apollo uh, 19 hoaxers, it seems to be in full effect. And this is, again, another part. You, you can say, oh, well, I know those landings were true because, you know, these guys heard space music on the backside of the moon. So why would I doubt the uh, the official statement from NASA? Um, it, yeah, of course, I can't prove that out, but that's just kind of the sensibility that I've been picking up on of late. There's, there's no doubt. There, you know, they, they can't hold this lie up forever. And what's funny is, um, you know, everyone's heard me talk about how they put, uh, how they tried to shame all the people that didn't believe the moon landings were real on the cover of National Geo. And there's been some other things they've done it in some of the Sky and Telescope magazines. Um, there's been a whole push to try to shame these crazy people who would challenge, you know, Buzz Aldrin and, you know, <laughs> all these guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're starting to run up the flagpole, uh, the, what the admission that it was faked looks like. And they did it in Interstellar where um, mm -hmm. I forget what the excuse was. Yeah, we faked the Apollo missions, but it was just to bankrupt the Russians or something like that. Yes, yeah. Um, so they're already starting to run it up the flagpole, you know, to, to deal with the admission that has to come because they can't keep faking it. And at the rate things are going, um, if, if any of the researchers I talk to are anywhere near correct, um, people are going to be aware pretty quickly that nobody's getting out of this place, um, that space has been misdescribed, that the moon and sun are not what you've been told. But um, let's keep on moving down the road. Mm -hmm. um, did you actually see uh, – we, we had talked about Interstellar and The Martian. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to see both of those? I did. I did. Yeah, very uh, unique films, both of them. I mean they're both with flaws from I guess from a storytelling thing, but uh, the two messages – uh, very different in, in a lot of different angles. The thing that really drove me crazy was the Matt Damon movie, um, Martian, before it was released. Um, they had announced on a Friday that they were probably going to announce on a Monday mm -hmm. that there was likely water on Mars. And mm -hmm. Monday came, and sure enough, they announced, oh, yeah, there's been water on Mars. Uh, big finding. And the thing that kicked me in the head was that that Friday they released The Martian. So you could just see how interconnected Hollywood, NASA, and the whole disinformation machine were. But anyhow, um, do you have a comparison to make with those two movies? Yeah, you know, at a very high level, uh, you know, you begin with The Martian, and you have kind of a, a, a rose-colored glass of what NASA is and the NASA mission and so forth. You know, it's I don't know when it's set in the future, if it's present day, but you have an, a NASA administration that's very forthcoming, uh, all about full disclosure with the public. Um, you have a group of scientists and astronauts who are on the planet Mars, uh, you know, exploring. Uh, obviously, they're setting up for future expansion of the human species on this planet and so forth, but it's very leisurely. Uh, things seem to be kind of going progressing as well. There's really no need to leave the planet Earth. They're not implying that. They're just saying we'll get there at some point in time, and this is just part of the natural progression of space exploration. Uh, some interesting things I really thought about that was the casting. For instance, the NASA officials, I mean, they were comedians, and you had uh, you know Jeff Daniel. Not that Jeff Daniel is not a serious actor, but I always think of him from being a dumb and dumber, I guess. Um, you know, that might just be my bias. But then there's also a, a Saturday Night Live comedian who was also part of that NASA official team. And I believe one of the astronauts is also a comedian that was on there. And uh, Matt Damon, to some extent, I think he was even nominated at maybe the Golden Globes or something for Best Actor in a Comedy, which I think is fairly interesting for a movie. It's supposed to be a hard sci-fi film about the future of human exploration of outer space. Uh, another thing I kind of thought interesting was uh, at the tail end, the uh, when he's escaping Mars, he makes reference to that he's going to just be like Iron Man. And so you've got him escaping the surface of Mars. He's able to get into Mars, and then he like pricks a, uh, like a hole in his spacesuit, and he's able to kind of float from this capsule back to the, to the main uh, rescue uh, craft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, was, it, it literally felt like a comic book at that time. I mean, I... 
I couldn't take it seriously. It, it just seemed so absurd, so ridiculous. Um, and that was kind of my take on the Martian. Um, it, if, if one were to gather, I mean, I would call it NASA uh, propaganda. Um, again, I don't have all the facts. I don't work for NASA. I don't have any insight. But it appeared kind of like a comic book movie, kind of a comedy that made light of the fact that space exploration is just kind of a, don't worry about it, we'll get there. You know, just just enjoy it. Uh, well, I think we can see evidence of them trying to poke a hole. And in a few minutes, we'll get to portals and the portal idea in media. Mm -hmm. But um, I recently, and I, I'm going to mention this because I know you have an interest in similar things and you read a lot. Um, I think I asked you at one point if you had read the book Dune, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Well, I was uh, rereading them for the reason that I believe that in those books, and actually in any book that makes, you know, that's so iconic, uh, Dune was, I think, the first ever sci fi book to hit the bestsellers list. Um, and it did it in hardback, and it kind of paved the way because after Dune did it, other sci-fi books began to register on the you know the top-selling New York Times you know best list or whatever it is. Um, but what's funny about the book Dune is the whole thing is written on two or three levels, and there is an absolute subtext going through the whole thing that relates directly with religion, which is clear in the Bene Gesserit, the OC Catholic Bible. Um, it's a very thin veil that lets you know that he is talking about the royalty, the political leadership, the religion, all these things, to include uh, environmentalism, which when this book began to catch fire shortly after its publishing, uh, many people were into it for its environmental, perceived environmental messaging. But... Uh, to, to make an example of the subtext that is written into this book um, that addresses things that matter, in the second chapter of the first book, Dune, uh, when the Baron, the fat Baron Harkonnen is first met, mm -hmm. uh, the whole sub-meme of the first part of that chapter is the Baron stating that the globe is the biggest man-trap in history. And I defy anyone to go back and read that and state categorically, even though it is subtextually and encoded, that there is no possibility that that is not what is being memed there. Um, people should go back and read that second chapter. But um, you've read Dune, and I know you've read a lot of, a lot of other things like it. What, what's your sense of the kind of undercurrent, not the surface reading that most people see, but the undercurrent that's being transmitted in such popular works? Um, I... I completely agree with the idea of predictive programming. I, I do think that there's a lot of uh, hidden messages in books. Uh, I think the one that re I recently reread was 2001 by Arthur C. Clarke. Um, I probably haven't read that for 20 years. But when you read it again, you, you pick up on uh, the idea that there's a problem with population growth, that there's a need for population control. Uh, you pick up on uh, – there's uh, the first part of the book completely deals with the character, an ape, who allegedly was the forebearer of humanity, and um, he was called the Moon Watcher. And this individual, this ape, was obsessed with watching the moon at night and wanted to touch it and wanted to grab it and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, these people such as Arthur C. Clarke or... Uh, who invented satellites, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all <laughs> these guys, I think... And telecommunications you know, to some degree. Yeah, I think they were in the know. I, I think... You see some of these uh, documentaries with these characters back in the 70s, you know, and they have smirks on their face when there are serious things being discussed. I don't know if that's their way of letting everybody know that, hey, this is just kind of a hoax or if they're actually having a good time talking about Earth being spherical or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's really it's, – it's interesting. You know, it's always – it's for me, it's to go back again. I mean, I feel like over the last year and a half, two years, I finally went kind of to a different level where – I I don't want to say I didn't pick up on things in the past, but I feel when I watch and read things and reread things now, I'm I'm picking up on a different pattern that was there that I completely missed, and I'm sure you know majority of the planet has missed when they read some of these things. I, I think there's no doubt. I think part of this is what I call the Grand Awakening of 2009, but another part of it is um, context is a bitch. Um, we are taught from cradle to grave how to contextually absorb things like that guy's a comic 
So the context there is nothing he's saying is serious. That's the context. Mm -hmm. um, it, it goes through everything, not just comedy, drama, tragedy, whatever it is. Um, context is constantly fooling um, the population of this world. And when you learn to deal with context in a different way so that it is not steering what you choose to understand and learn, you will see things in a whole other light. And, you know, as an example, that second chapter in Dune with the Baron Harkonnen, if you read it as a story that's entertaining you, you will not see that the globe is what the biggest man trap in history is. You will see it as the Atreides Duke is being led to Arrakis or Dune, the biggest man trap. But if you shift the context out and away from what you're reading and read the words for what they can mean, you will begin to see it. So I totally agree with what you're saying. But we're we're about 10 minutes short of an hour. I'd like to take a quick break so I can get my dog out. So okay. let me hang up, save this file, and I'll call you back in roughly five to seven minutes. Okay, sounds good, girl. All right, man. And here's what we cover in the second hour. We cover portal, portals, movie encoding, space as water, the prison planet, Babylon, the moon child, Parsons and magicians at NASA, L. Ron Hubbard connection, the Crowley connection, Richard Hoagland, black magic and Satanism at NASA, CERN, comic books, a Jewish relationship to comic book creation, firmament, the dome or the boundary of space, the media system, music, the Beatles, the hoaxed Paul McCartney, uh, famous rockers like Jimmy Page, encoded music, the death of Paul McCartney, the hoax Paul McCartney that we see now, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction of Ringo Starr by the new hoax Paul McCartney, the 27 Club, the weaponization of music, Beatle mania, Elvis mania for people who don't remember that, and then all the way back to the 1700s with Paganini, the first kind of mania music guy. We talk about the 4.3 hertz tuning versus the new 440 tuning, which is weaponized music. I talk about how to tune or retune your iPod music 2432. We talk about demons in music, knighted musicians working for the crown, royalty in music. We talk about and finally answer if Hattie Bob is a real person or Hattie Bow. We talk about the JFK assassination hoax, the hoax, the fake Zapruder film, and the future work of Sage Sigma Unbound blog, which James Alfred runs. And lastly, the world population. Is it possible that it never really changes? But that is all the stuff that we cover in the second hour, and it's a hell of a second hour. So I hope you'll join me at Crow Triple Seven Radio. 